Chapter 5 Through Florida Swamps and Forests Of the people of the states that I have now passed, I best like the Georgians. They have charming manners, and their dwellings are mostly larger and better than those of the adjacent states. However costly or ornamental their homes or their manners, they do not, like those of the New Englander, appear as the fruits of intense and painful sacrifice and training, but are entirely divested of artificial weights and measures, and seem to pervade and twine about their characters as spontaneous grows with a durability and charm of living nature. In particular, Georgians, even the commonest, have a most charmingly cordial way of saying to strangers, as they proceed on their journey, I wish you well, sir. The Negroes of Georgia, too, are extremely mannerly and polite, and appear always to be delighted to find opportunity for obliging anybody. Athens contains many beautiful residences. I never before saw so much about a home that was so evidently done for beauty only, although this is by no means a universal characteristic of Georgian homes. Nearly all the well-to-do farmers' families in Georgia and Tennessee spin and weave their own cloth. This work is almost all done by the mothers and daughters, and consumes much of their time. The traces of war are not only apparent on the broken fields, burnt fences, mills, and woods ruthlessly slaughtered, but also on the countenances of the people. A few years after a forest has been burned, another generation of bright and happy trees arises, in purest, freshest vigor. Only the old trees, wholly or half dead, bear marks of the calamity. So with the people of this war field, happy, unscarred, and unclouded youth is growing up around the aged, half-consumed, and fallen parents, who bear in sad measure the ineffaceable marks of the farthest reaching and most infernal of all civilized calamities. Since the commencement of my floral pilgrimage, I have seen much that is not only new, but altogether unallied, unacquainted with the plants of my former life. I have seen magnolias, tupelo, live oak, Kentucky oak, tillandsia, long-leafed pine, palmetto, scrankia, and whole forests of strange trees and vine-tied thickets of blooming shrubs, whole meadowfuls of magnificent bamboo and lakefuls of lilies, all new to me, yet I still press eagerly on to Florida as the special home of the tropical plants I am looking for, and I feel sure I shall not be disappointed. The same day on which the money arrived I took passage on the steamship Sylvan Shore for Ferdandina, Florida. The daylight part of this sail along the coast of Florida was full of novelty, and by association awakened memories of my Scottish days at Dunbar on the Firth of Forth. On board I had civilized conversation with a southern planter on topics that are found floating in the mind of every white man down here who has a single thought. I also met a brother Scotchman who was especially interesting and had some ideas outside of southern politics. Altogether my half day and night on board the steamer were pleasant and carried me past a very sickly, entangled, overflowed, and unwalkable piece of forest. It is pretty well known that a short geological time ago the ocean covered the sandy level margin, extending from the foot of the Alleghenies to the present coastline, and in receding left many basins for lakes and swamps. The land is still encroaching on the sea, and it does so not evenly, in a regular line, but in fringing lagoons and inlets and dot-like coral islands. It is on the coast strip of isles and peninsulas that sea island cotton is grown, some of these small islands are afloat, anchored only by the roots of mangroves and rushes. For a few hours our steamer sailed in the open sea, exposed to its waves, but most of the time she treaded her way along the lagoons, the home of alligators and countless stocks and waders. October 15. Today at last I reached Florida, the so-called land of flowers, that I had so long waited for, wondering if after all my longings and prayers would be in vain and I should die without a glimpse of the flowery Canaan. But here it is, at the distance of a few yards, a flat, watery, reedy coast with clumps of mangrove and forests of moss-dressed, strange trees appearing low in the distance. The steamer finds her way among the reedy islands, like a duck, and I step on a rickety wharf. 
A few steps more take me to a rickety town, Fernandina. I discover a baker, buy some bread, and without asking a single question, make for the shady, gloomy groves. In visiting Florida in dreams, of either day or night, I always come suddenly on a close forest of trees, every one in flower, and bent down and entangled to network by luxuriant, bright-blooming vines, and over all a flood of bright sunlight. But such was not the gate by which I entered the promised land. Salt marshes, belonging more to the sea than to the land, with groves here and there, green and unflowered, sunk to the shoulders in sedges and rushes, with trees farther back, ill-defined in their boundary, and instead of rising in hilly waves and swellings, stretching inland in low, water-like levels. We were all discharged by the captain of the steamer without breakfast, and, after meeting and examining the new plants that crowded about me, I threw down my press and little bag beneath a thicket, where there was a dry spot on some broken heaps of grass and roots, something like a deserted muskrat house, and applied myself to my bread breakfast. Everything in earth and sky had an impression of strangeness, not a mark of friendly recognition, not a breath, not a spirit whisper of sympathy came from anything about me, and of course I was lonely. I lay on my elbow eating my bread, gazing, and listening to the profound strangeness. While thus engaged I was startled from these gatherings of melancholy by a rustling sound in the rushes behind me. Had my mind been in health, and my body not starved, I should have only turned calmly to the noise. But in this half-starved, unfriended condition, I could have no healthy thought, and at once I believed that the sound came from an alligator. I fancied I could feel the stroke of his long-notched tail, and could see his big jaws and rows of teeth, closing with a springy snap on me, as I had seen in pictures. Well, I don't know the exact measure of my fright, either in time or pain, but when I did come to a knowledge of the truth, my man-eating alligator became a tall white crane, handsome as a minister from Spiritland. Only that. I was ashamed, and tried to excuse myself on account of Bonaventure anxiety and hunger. Florida is so watery and vine-tied that pathless wanderings are not easily possible in any direction. I started to cross the state by a gap hewn for the locomotive, walking sometimes between the rails, stepping from tie to tie, or walking on the strip of sand at the sides, gazing into the mysterious forest, nature's own. It is impossible to write the dimmest picture of plant grandeur so redundant, unfathomable. Short was the measure of my walk to-day. A new, cane-like grass, or big lily, or gorgeous flower belonging to a tree or vine, would catch my attention, and I would throw down my bag and press and splash through the coffee-brown water for specimens. Frequently I sank deeper and deeper until compelled to turn back and make the attempt in another and still another place. Oftentimes I was tangled in a labyrinth of armed vines like a fly in a spider web. At all times, whether wading or climbing a tree for specimens of fruit, I was overwhelmed with the vastness and unapproachableness of the great guarded sea of sunny plants. Magnolia grandiflora I had seen in Georgia, but its home, its better land, is here. Its large dark green leaves, glossy bright above and rusty brown beneath, gleam and mirror the sunbeams most gloriously among countless flower heaps of the climbing, smothering vines. It is bright also in fruit, and more tropical in form and expression than the orange. It speaks itself a prince among its fellows. Occasionally I came to a little strip of open sand, planted with pine, Pinus palustris, or cubensis. Even these spots were mostly wet, though lighted with free sunshine, and adorned with purple laetris and orange-colored osmunda cinnamonia. But the grandest discovery of this great wild day was the palmetto. I was meeting so many strange plants that I was much excited, making many stops to get specimens, but I could not force my way far through the swampy forest, although so tempting and full of promise. Regardless of water snakes or insects, I endeavored repeatedly to force a way through the tough vine tangles, but seldom succeeded in getting farther than a few hundred yards. It was while feeling sad to think that I was only walking on the edge of the vast wood, 
that I caught sight of the first palmetto in a grassy place, standing almost alone. A few magnolias were near it, and a bald cypress, but it was not shaded by them. They tell us that plants are perishable, soulless creatures, that only man is immortal, etc. But this, I think, is something that we know very nearly nothing about. Anyhow, this palm was indescribably impressive, and told me grander things than I ever got from human priest. This vegetable has a plain grey shaft, round as a broom handle, and a crown of varnished channeled leaves. It is a plainer plant than the humblest of Wisconsin oaks, but, whether rocking and rustling in the wind, or poised thoughtful and calm in the sunshine, it has a power of expression not excelled by any plant, high or low, that I have met in my whole walk thus far. This, my first specimen, was not very tall, only about twenty-five feet high, with fifteen or twenty leaves, arching equally and evenly all around. Each leaf was about ten feet in length, the blade four feet, the stalk six. The leaves are channeled like half-open clams, and are highly polished, so that they reflect the sunlight like glass. The undeveloped leaves on the top stand erect, closely folded, all together forming an oval crown over which the tropic light is poured and reflected from its slanting mirrors in sparks and splinters and long-rayed stars. I am now in the hot gardens of the sun, where the palm meets the pine, longed and prayed for and often visited in dreams, and, though lonely to-night amidst this multitude of strangers, strange plants, strange winds blowing gently, whispering, cooing, in a language I never learned, and strange birds also, everything solid or spiritual full of influences that I never before felt, yet I thank the Lord with all my heart for his goodness in granting me admission to this magnificent realm. October 16. Last evening, when I was in the trackless wood, the great mysterious night becoming more mysterious in the thickening darkness, I gave up hope of finding food, or a house-bed, and searched only for a dry spot on which to sleep, safely hidden from wild, runaway negroes. I walked rapidly for hours in the wet, level woods, but not a foot of dry ground could I find. Hollow-voiced owls were calling without intermission. All manner of night sounds came from strange insects and beasts, one by one, or crowded together. All had a home but I. Jacob, on the dry plains of Padanaram, with a stone pillow, must have been comparatively happy. When I came to an open place where pines grew, it was about ten o'clock, and I thought that now at last I would find dry ground. But even the sandy barren was wet, and I had to grope in the dark for a long time, feeling the ground with my hands when my feet ceased to plash, before I at last discovered a little hillock dry enough to lie down on. I ate a piece of bread that I fortunately had in my bag, drank some of the brown water about my precious hillock, and lay down. The noisiest of the unseen witnesses around me were the owls, who pronounced their gloomy speeches with profound emphasis, but did not prevent the coming of sleep to heal weariness. In the morning I was cold and wet with dew, and I set out breakfastless. Flowers and beauty I had in abundance, but no bread. A serious matter is this bread which perishes, and, could it be dispensed with, I doubt if civilization would ever see me again, I walked briskly, watching for a house, as well as the grand assemblies of novel plants. Near the middle of the forenoon I came to a shanty where a party of loggers were getting out long pines for ship spars. They were the wildest of all the white savages I have met. The long-haired ex-gorillas of the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina are uncivilized fellows, but for downright barbarism these Florida loggers excel. Nevertheless, they gave me a portion of their yellow pork and hominy without either apparent hospitality or grudge, and I was glad to escape to the forest again. A few hours later I dined with three men and three dogs. I was viciously attacked by the latter, who undertook to undress me with their teeth. I was nearly dragged down backward, but escaped unbitten. Liver pie, mixed with sweet potatoes and fat duff, was set before me, and after I had finished a moderate portion, one of the men, turning to his companion, remarked, "'Wall, I guess that man quit eatin' cause he had nothin' more to eat. I'll get him more potato.' 
arrived at a place on the margin of a stagnant pool where an alligator had been rolling and sunning himself. See, said a man who lived here, see, what a track that is. He must have been a mighty big fellow. Alligators wallow like hogs and like to lie in the sun. I'd like a shot at that fellow. Here followed a long recital of bloody combats with the scaly enemy, in many of which he had, of course, taken an important part. Alligators are said to be extremely fond of negroes and dogs, and naturally the dogs and negroes are afraid of them. Another man that I met today pointed to a shallow, grassy pond before his door. There, said he, I once had a tough fight with an alligator. He caught my dog. I heard him howling, and as he was one of the best hunters I tried hard to save him. The water was only about knee-deep, and I ran up to the alligator. It was only a small one, about four feet long, and was having trouble in his efforts to drown the dog in the shallow water. I scared him and made him let go his hold, but before the poor crippled dog could reach the shore, he was caught again, and when I went at the alligator with a knife it seized my arm. If it had been a little stronger it might have eaten me instead of my dog. I never in all my travels saw more than one, though they are said to be abundant in most of the swamps, and frequently attain a length of nine or ten feet. It is reported also that they are very savage, oftentimes attacking men in boats. These independent inhabitants of the sluggish waters of this low coast cannot be called the friends of man, though I heard of one big fellow that was caught young and was partially civilized and made to work in harness. Many good people believe that alligators were created by the devil, thus accounting for their all-consuming appetite and ugliness. But doubtless these creatures are happy and fill the place assigned to them by the great creator of us all. Fierce and cruel they appear to us, but beautiful in the eyes of God. They, also, are his children, for he hears their cries, cares for them tenderly, and provides their daily bread. The antipathies existing in the Lord's great animal family must be wisely planned, like balanced repulsion and attraction in the mineral kingdom. How narrow we selfish, conceited creatures are in our sympathies! How blind to the rights of all the rest of creation! With what dismal irreverence we speak of our fellow mortals! Though alligators, snakes, etc., naturally repel us, they are not mysterious evils. They dwell happily in these flowery wilds, are part of God's family, unfallen, undepraved, and cared for with the same species of tenderness and love as is bestowed on angels in heaven or saints on earth. I think that most of the antipathies which haunt and terrify us are morbid productions of ignorance and weakness. I have better thoughts of those alligators now that I have seen them at home. Honorable representatives of the great sorens of an older creation, may you long enjoy your lilies and rushes, and be blessed now and then with a mouthful of terror-stricken man by way of a dainty. I found a beautiful lycopodium today, and many grasses in the dry sunlit places called barrens, hummocks, savannas, etc. Ferns are also abundant. What a flood of heat and light is daily poured out on these beautiful openings and intertangled woods. The land of the sunny south, we say, but no part of our diversified country is more shaded and covered from sunshine. Many a sunny sheet of plain and prairie breaks the continuity of the forests of the north and the west, and the forests themselves are mostly lighted also. Pierced with direct ray lances, or the sunlight passing to the earth and the lowly plants in filtered softness through translucent leaves. But in the dense Florida forests, sunlight cannot enter. It falls on the evergreen roof and rebounds in long silvery lances and flashy spray. In many places there is not light sufficient to feed a single green leaf on these dark forest floors. All that the eye can reach is just a maze of tree stems and crooked leafless vine strings. All the flowers, all the verdure, all the glory is up in the light. The streams of Florida are still young, and in many places untraceable. I expected to find these streams a little discolored from the vegetable matter that I knew they must contain and I was sure that in so flat a country I should not find any considerable falls or long rapids. The streams of Upper Georgia are almost unapproachable in some places on account of luxuriant bordering vines, but the banks are nevertheless high and well-defined. 
Florida streams are not yet possessed of banks, and braes, and definite channels. Their waters in deep places are black as ink, perfectly opaque, and glossy on the surface as if varnished. It is often difficult to ascertain which way they are flowing or creeping, so slowly and so widely do they circulate through the tree tangles and swamps of the woods. The flowers here are strangers to me, but not more so than the lakes and rivers. Most streams appear to travel through a country with thoughts and plans for something beyond. But those of Florida are at home and do not appear to be traveling at all, and seem to know nothing of the sea. October 17. Found a small, silvery-leafed magnolia, a bush ten feet high. Passed through a good many miles of open level pine barrens, as bounteously lighted up as the openings of Wisconsin. The pines are rather small, are planted sparsely and pretty evenly on these sandy flats, not long risen from the sea. Scarcely a specimen of any other tree is to be found associated with the pine, but there are some thickets of the little saw palmentos, and a magnificent assemblage of tall grasses, their splendid panicles waving grandly in the warm wind, and making low, tuneful changes in the glistening light that is flashed from their bent stems. Not a pine, not a palm, in all this garden excels these stately grass plants in beauty of wind-waving gestures. Here are panicles that are one mass of refined purple, others that have flowers as yellow as ripe oranges, and stems polished and shining like steel wire. Some of the species are grouped in groves and thickets like trees, while others may be seen waving without any companions in sight. Some of them have wide branching pinnacles like Kentucky oaks, others with a few tassels of spikelets drooping from a tall, leafless stem. But all of them are beautiful beyond the reach of language. I rejoice that God has so clothed the grass of the field. How strangely we are blinded to beauty and color, form and motion, by comparative size. For example, we measure grasses by our own stature and by the height and bulkiness of trees. But what is the size of the greatest man or the tallest tree that ever overtopped a grass? Compared with other things in God's creation, the difference is nothing. We are all only microscopic animalcula. October 18. I am walking on land that is almost dry. The dead levels are interrupted here and there by sandy waves a few feet in height. It is said that not a point in all Florida is more than 300 feet above sea level, a country where but little grading is required for roads, but much bridging and boring of many tunnels through forests. Before reaching this open ground, in a lonely, swampy place in the woods, I met a large, muscular, brawny young negro who eyed me with glaring, wistful curiosity. I was very thirsty at the time, and inquired of the man if there were any houses or springs nearby where I could get a drink. Oh, yes, he replied, still eagerly searching me with his wild eyes. Then he inquired where I came from, where I was going, and what brought me to such a wild country, where I was liable to be robbed and perhaps killed. Oh, I am not afraid of anyone robbing me, I said, for I don't carry anything worth stealing. Yes, he said, but you can't travel without money. I started to walk on, but he blocked my way. Then I noticed that he was trembling, and it flashed upon me all at once that he was thinking of knocking me down in order to rob me. After glaring at my pockets as if searching for weapons, he stammered in a quavering voice, Do you carry shooting irons? His motives, which I ought to have noted sooner, were now apparent to me. Though I had no pistol, I instinctively threw my hand back to my pistol pocket, and, with my eyes fixed on his, I marched up close to him and said, I allow people to find out if I am armed or not. Then he quailed, stepped aside, and allowed me to pass for fear of being shot. This was evidently a narrow escape. A few miles farther on I came to a cotton field, to patches of sugar cane carefully fenced, and some respectable-looking houses with gardens. These little fenced fields look as if they were intended to be for plants what cages are for birds, discovered a large, tree-like cactus in a dooryard. A small species was abundant on the sand hillocks. Reached Gainesville late in the night. When within three or four miles of the town, I noticed a light off in the pine woods. As I was very thirsty, I thought I would venture toward it with the hope of obtaining water. 
in creeping cautiously and noiselessly through the grass to discover whether or no it was a camp of robber negroes i came suddenly in full view of the best lighted and most primitive of all the domestic establishments i have yet seen in town or grove there was first of all a big glowing log fire illuminating the overleaning bushes and trees bringing out leaf and spray with more than noonday distinctness and making still darker the surrounding wood in the centre of this globe of light sat two negroes i could see their ivory gleaming from the great lips and their smooth cheeks flashing off light as if made of glass seen anywhere but in the south the glossy pair would have been taken for twin devils but here it was only a negro and his wife at their supper i ventured forward to the radiant presence of the black pair and after being stared at with that desperate fixedness which is said to subdue the lion i was handed water in a gourd from somewhere out of the darkness i was standing for a moment beside the big fire looking at the unsurpassable simplicity of the establishment and asking questions about the road to gainesville when my attention was called to a black lump of something lying in the ashes of the fire it seemed to be made of rubber but ere i had time for much speculation the woman bent wooingly over the black object and said with motherly kindness come honey eat your hominy at this sound of hominy the rubber gave strong manifestations of vitality and proved to be a burly little negro boy rising from the earth naked as to the earth he came had he emerged from the black mush of a marsh we might easily have believed that the lord had manufactured him like adam direct from the earth surely i thought as i started for gainesville surely i am now coming to the tropics where the inhabitants wear nothing but their own skins this fashion is sufficiently simple no troublesome disguises as milton calls clothing but certainly it is not quite in harmony with nature birds make nests and nearly all bees make some kind of bed for their young but these negroes allow their younglings to lie nestless and naked in the dirt gainesville is rather attractive an oasis in the desert compared with other villages it gets its life from the few plantations located about it on dry ground that rises island-like a few feet above the swamps obtained food and lodging at a sort of tavern october nineteen dry land nearly all day encountered limestone flint coral shells etc passed several thrifty cotton plantations with comfortable residences contrasting sharply with the squalid hovels of my first days in florida found a single specimen of a handsome little plant which at once in some mysterious way brought to mind a young friend in indiana how wonderfully our thoughts and impressions are stored there is that in the glance of a flower which may at times control the greatest of creation's braggart lords the magnolia is much more abundant here it forms groves and almost exclusively forests the edge of ponds and the banks of streams the easy dignified simplicity of this noble tree its plain leaf endowed with superb richness of color and form its open branches festooned with graceful vines and tillandsia its showy crimson fruit and its magnificent fragrant white flowers make magnolia grandiflora the most lovable of florida trees discovered a great many beautiful polygonums petalostemons and yellow leguminous vines passed over fine sunny areas of the long-leafed and cuban pines which were everywhere accompanied by fine grasses and solidagos wild orange groves are said to be rather common here but i have seen only limes growing wild in the woods came to a hut about noon and being weary and hungry asked if i could have dinner after serious consultation i was told to wait that dinner would soon be ready i saw only the man and his wife if they had children they may have been hidden in the weeds on account of nakedness both were suffering from malarial fever and were very dirty but they did not appear to have any realizing sense of discomfort from either the one or the other of these misfortunes the dirt which encircled the countenances of these people did not like the common dirt of the north stick on the skin in bold union like plaster or paint but appeared to stand out a little on contact like a hazy misty half aerial mud envelope the most diseased and incurable dirt that i ever saw evidently desperately chronic and hereditary it seems impossible that children from such parents could ever be clean dirt and disease are dreadful enough when separate 
but combined are inconceivably horrible. The neat cottage, with a fragrant circumference of thyme and honeysuckle, is almost unknown here. I have seen dirt on garments regularly stratified, the various strata no doubt indicating different periods of life. Some of them, perhaps, were annual layers, furnishing, like those of trees, a means of determining the age. Man and other civilized animals are the only creatures that ever become dirty. Slept in the barrens at the side of a log, suffered from cold and was drenched with dew, what a comfort a companion would be in the dark loneliness of such nights. Did not dare to make a fire for fear of discovery by robber negroes, who, I was warned, would kill a man for a dollar or two. Had a long walk after nightfall, hoping to discover a house. Became very thirsty, and often was compelled to drink from slimy pools groped for in the grass, with a fear of alligators before my eyes. October 20th. Swamp very dense during this day's journey. Almost one continuous sheet of water covered with aquatic trees and vines, no stream that I crossed today appeared to have the least idea of where it was going. Saw an alligator push into the sedgy brown water by the roadside from an old log. Arrived at night at the house of Captain Simmons, one of the very few scholarly, intelligent men that I have met in Florida. He had been an officer in the Confederate Army in the war and was, of course, prejudiced against the North, but polite and kind to me, nevertheless. Our conversation as we sat by the light of the fire, was on the one great question, slavery and its concomitants. I managed, however, to switch off to something more congenial occasionally, the birds of the neighborhood, the animals, the climate, and what spring, summer, and winter are like in these parts. About the climate, I could not get much information, as he had always lived in the South and, of course, saw nothing extraordinary in weather to which he had always been accustomed. But in speaking of animals, he at once became enthusiastic and told many stories of hair-breath escapes in the woods about his house, from bears, hungry alligators, wounded deer, etc. And now, said he, forgetting in his kindness that I was from the hated north, you must stay with me a few days. Deer are abundant. I will lend you a rifle, and we'll go hunting. I hunt whenever I wish venison, and I can get it about as easily from the woods nearby as a shepherd can get mutton out of his flock. And perhaps we will see a bear, for they are far from scarce here, and there are some big gray wolves, too. I expressed a wish to see some large alligators. Oh, well, he said, I can take you where you will see plenty of those fellows, but they are not much to look at. I once got a good look at an alligator that was lying at the bottom of still, transparent water, and I think that his eyes were the most impressively cold and cruel of any animal I have seen. Many alligators go out to sea among the keys. These sea alligators are the largest and most ferocious, and sometimes attack people by trying to strike them with their tails when they are out fishing in boats. Another thing I wish you to see, he continued, is a palmetto grove on a rich hummock a few miles from here. The grove is about seven miles in length, by three in breadth. The ground is covered with long grass, uninterrupted with bushes or other trees, it is the finest grove of palmettos that I have ever seen, and I have oftentimes thought that it would make a fine subject for an artist. I concluded to stop, more to see this wonderful palmetto hummock than to hunt. Besides, I was weary, and the prospect of getting a little rest was a tempting consideration after so many restless nights and long, hard walks by day. October 21 Having outlived the sanguinary hunter's tales of my loquacious host, and breakfasted scrumptiously on fresh venison, and collar fish from the sea, I set out for the grand palm grove. I had seen these dazzling sun-children in every day of my walk through Florida, but they were usually standing solitary, or in groups of three or four. But today I was to see them by the mile. The captain led me a short distance through his cornfield, and showed me a trail which would conduct me to the palmy hummock. He pointed out the general direction, which I noted upon my compass. Now, he said, at the other side of my father's field you will come to a jungle of catbriars, but will be able to pass them if you manage to keep the trail. You will find that the way is not by any means well marked, for in passing through a broad swamp the trail makes a good many abrupt turns to avoid deep water, fallen trees, or impenetrable thickets. You will have to wade a good deal and in passing the water-covered places you will have to watch for the point where the trail comes out on the opposite side. 
I made my way through the briars, which in strength and ferocity equaled those of Tennessee, followed the path through all of its dim waverings, waded through many opposing pools, and, emerging suddenly from the leafy darkness of the swamp forest, at last stood free and unshaded on the border of the sun-drenched palm garden. It was a level area of grasses and sedges, smooth as a prairie, well starred with flowers, and bounded like a clearing by a wall of vine-laden trees. The palms had full possession and appeared to enjoy their sunny home. There was no jostling, no apparent effort to outgrow each other. Abundance of sunlight was there for every crown, and plenty to fall between. I walked enchanted in their midst. What a landscape! Only palms as far as the eye could reach. Smooth pillars rising from the grass, each capped with a sphere of leaves, shining in the sun as bright as a star. The silence and calm were as deep as I ever found in the dark, solemn pine woods of Canada. And that contentment, which is an attribute of the best of God's plant people, was as impressively felt in this alligator wilderness as in the homes of the happy, healthy people of the north. The admirable Linnaeus calls palms the princes of the vegetable world. I know that there is grandeur and nobility in their character, and that there are palms nobler far than these, but in rank they appear to me to stand below both the oak and the pine. The motions of the palms, their gestures, are not very graceful. They appear to best advantage when perfectly motionless in the noontide calm and intensity of light, but they rustle and rock in the evening wind. I have seen grasses waving with far more dignity, and when our northern pines are waving and bowing in sign of worship with the winter storm winds, where is the prince of palms that could have the conscience to demand their homage? Members of this palm congregation were of all sizes with respect to their stems, but their glorious crowns were all alike. In development there is only the terminal bud to consider. The young palm of this species emerges from the ground in full strength, one cluster of leaves arched every way, making a sphere about ten or twelve feet in diameter. The outside lower leaves gradually become yellow, wither, and break off, the petioli snapping squarely across, a few inches from the stem. New leaves develop with wonderful rapidity. They stand erect at first, but gradually arch outward, as they expand their blades and lengthen their petioles. New leaves arrive constantly from the center of the grand bud, while old ones break away from the outside. The splendid crowns are thus kept about the same size, perhaps a little larger than in youth, while they are yet on the ground. As the development of the central axis goes on, the crown is gradually raised on a stem of about six to twelve inches in diameter. This stem is of equal thickness at the top and at the bottom, and when young is roughened with broken petioles. But these petiole stumps fall off and disappear as they become old, and the trunk becomes smooth as if turned in a lathe. After some hours in this charming forest, I started on the return journey before night, on account of the difficulties of the swamp and the briar patch. On leaving the palmettos and entering the vine-tangled, half-submerged forest, I sought long and carefully, but in vain, for the trail, for I had drifted about too incautiously in search of plants. But, recollecting the direction that I had followed in the morning, I took a compass-bearing and started to penetrate the swamp in a direct line. Of course I had a sore, weary time, pushing through the tanglement of falling, standing, and half-fallen trees and bushes, to say nothing of knotted vines as remarkable for their efficient army of interlocking and lancing prickers as for their length and the number of their blossoms. But these were not my greatest obstacles, nor yet the pools and lagoons full of dead leaves and alligators. It was the army of catbriars that I most dreaded. I knew that I would have to find the narrow slit of a lane before dark or spend the night with mosquitoes and alligators without food or fire. The entire distance was not great, but a traveler in open woods can form no idea of the crooked and strange difficulties of pathless locomotion in these thorny, watery southern tangles, especially in pitch darkness. I struggled hard and kept my course, leaving the general direction only when drawn aside by a plant of extraordinary promise that I wanted for a specimen or when I had to make the half-circuit of a pile of trees, or of a deep lagoon or pond. In wading, I never attempted to keep my clothes dry, because the water was too deep, and the necessary care would consume too much time. 
Had the water that I was forced to wade been transparent, it would have lost much of its difficulty. But as it was, I constantly expected to plant my feet on an alligator, and therefore proceeded with strained caution. The opacity of the water caused uneasiness also, on account of my inability to determine its depth. In many places I was compelled to turn back, after waiting forty or fifty yards, and to try again a score of times before I succeeded in getting across a single lagoon. At length, after miles of waiting and wallowing, I arrived at the grand catbriar encampment, which guarded the whole forest in solid phalanx, unmeasured miles up and down across my way. Alas, the trail by which I had crossed in the morning was not to be found, and night was near. In vain I scrambled back and forth in search of an opening. There was not even a strip of dry ground on which to rest. Everywhere the long briars arched over to the vines and bushes of the watery swamp, leaving no standing ground between them. I began to think of building some sort of scaffold in a tree to rest on through the night, but concluded to make one more desperate effort to find the narrow track. After calm, concentrated recollection of my course, I made a long exploration toward the left down the briar line, and after scrambling a mile or so, perspiring and bleeding, I discovered the blessed trail and escaped to dry land and the light. Reached the captain at sundown, dined on milk and johnny cake and fresh venison, was congratulated on my singular good fortune in woodcraft, and soon after supper was sleeping the deep sleep of the weary and the safe. October 22. This morning I was easily prevailed upon by the captain and an ex-judge, who is rusticating here, to join in a deer hunt. Had a delightful ramble in the long grass and flowery barrens. Started one deer, but did not draw a single shot. The captain, the judge, and myself stood at different stations where the deer was expected to pass, while a brother of the captain entered the woods to arouse the game from cover. The one deer that he started took a direction different from any which this particular old buck had ever been known to take in times past, and in so doing was cordially cursed as being the deedest deer that ever ran unshot. To me it appeared as deedest work to slaughter God's cattle for sport. They were made for us, says these self-approving preachers, for our food, our recreation, or other uses not yet discovered. As truthfully we might say on behalf of a bear, when he deals successfully with an unfortunate hunter, men and other bipeds were made for bears, and thanks be to God for claws and teeth so long. Let a Christian hunter go to the Lord's woods and kill his well-kept beasts, or wild Indians, and it is well. But let an enterprising specimen of these proper predestined victims go to houses and fields and kill the most worthless person of the vertical godlike killers. Oh, that is horribly unorthodox, and on the part of the Indians atrocious murder. Well, I have precious little sympathy for the selfish propriety of civilized man, and if a war of races should occur between the wild beasts and lord man, I would be tempted to sympathize with the bears. End of chapter 5